Hello, and welcome to another Sunday School Lesson Review Broadcast for Sunday, April 11th, 2021. The lesson review is taken from Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 11. And I am your host, Minister William Gadson, and I greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ. You see, it is, it is Jesus that enables us to get the word of God out to you, the listening public. We originate from the Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church, located in the Colleen Fort Hood, Texas area. Our address is 4201 Zephyr Road, Colleen, Texas, 76543. You can reach us by telephone at area code 254-680-4378. But if you prefer to reach us online, our website is www.greaterpeace.com. You can also communicate with us by email. Our email address is greaterpeacembc at peoplepc.com. Now, we at Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church provide a variety of services for your Christian growth. A complete schedule of services and activities can be viewed on our website. So, please join us in extending God's kingdom here on earth. And I am your host, Minister William Gadsden, and I thank God for you supporting this ministry. Now let us pray before beginning our Sunday School lesson. Gracious Father, it is again, as always, that I want to thank you for the opportunity to spread the gospel of your word. I thank you for those that are listening, Lord. And Lord, help this, this lesson to be a blessing, as I always say, to those that are listening in the way that you see that we should be, they should be blessed. And Lord, the Holy, and we ask the Holy Spirit to be with us as we go through this lesson, because the Holy Spirit is with us. We know that there is a guiding force that will give us the right answers and give us the right meaning for all that your scripture says. We thank you for him, and we ask you to go with us as we go through this lesson. I thank you, and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, introduction, short introduction today. The Sunday School lesson is titled, Justification by Faith. Now, such a title indicates that justification and faith are the subject of this lesson. In this introduction, I want to define the word justification and also the word faith and comment on each of them as well. So let's get started by defining the word justification. Now, in Christian theology, justification is a method God uses to move a willing person that is a believer from the state of injustice or sinfulness or to a state of grace or justice. Now, based on this definition of justification, one can see that this is similar to our human court system. That is, if a judge declares a defendant not guilty in a court of law, then all charges against the defendant are dismissed. Now, the definition of justification in God's court is essentially the same. However, God will forgive all present and past sins of a defendant that is a sinner when the person swears allegiance or believes in Jesus Christ. But when we define the word faith, we have a different picture when we compare human courts and God's court. Once a defendant in man's court is acquitted, his faith may or may not indicate a faith in the system of law on earth. But in God's court, faith is a requirement for acquittal of sin, and many may ask, what is faith and why is it a requirement of God to, for, for justification? Now, if we want to find the answer to that, we can look at Hebrews 11. Chapter 11, chapter verse 1, which defines faith as a following. And it kind of helps us understand why faith is necessary with God. Now, faith is a substance. Well, I'm not reading the, I'm saying the, the, the King James Version, but I'm reading the NIV Version. So the NIV Version says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. And that's the NIV version. Now, in fact, without faith, the sinner will never be acquitted of sin in God's courts, as witnessed by Scripture in, a, in Hebrews 11, chapter, verse 6. 
And it reads, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, we are all familiar with the phrase, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Now, people of this world or non-believers often state that they do not trust anything they cannot see and use that as an exist excuse to not have faith in God. Yet these same people will get in a jet plane that relies on the presence of air in the atmosphere in order to stay aloft and travel from place to place. Now, these people, these same people also rely Reply, rely on magnetic forces, which they cannot see, but these are the forces that are used to run the motors that they use on a daily basis. Now, none of us can see air or the magnetic force, but we believe in them because we have evidence that they exist in the things that we use. Now, we cannot see God, but he is a, he is a creator of this world and is the one who provides a safe, a, provided a savior who died on the cross so our sins could be forgiven. So one might ask a sinner, why can't he believe in God who cannot, who he cannot see, yet he believes in the presence of atmospheric air and the forces of magnetism? So if a sinner does not believe in the existence of God, he cannot be saved because scripture in Hebrews 11, 6 states, or stated, as stated above, indicates this type of sinner cannot be saved. And again, I repeat, Hebrews 11, 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, what are the rewards? The you may not see all the rewards here on earth, but uh, peace, love, and all of those things. We all go through things here on earth, but that these things, those things will be easier to go through if we believe in Jesus. Now, so if a sinner does not believe that God exists, he has no faith in God, and therefore God cannot forgive his sins because if a sinner does not believe in God exists, then it is obvious that the sinner has no faith. Therefore, it is impossible for God to please a sinner who does not believe in him. Likewise, we cannot see faith, but faith needs no visible indicators to be real. Some things have to be believed and not seen. And that, my Christian friends, is the end of my introduction. As I said, it was a short introduction compared to ones in the past. So let's get into our Sunday school lesson, which is entitled Justification by Faith. The lesson text is taken from Romans the 11th chapter, Romans the 5th chapter, verse 1 through 11. Corrections. Now, golden text is Romans the 5th chapter, verse 8, which reads, But God commanded his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So our lesson sections, as there are three of them. First one being justified by faith in Christ, Romans the fifth chapter, verses one through five. Justified by the blood of Christ, Romans the fifth chapter, verses six through nine. And finally, justified by the life of Christ, Romans the fifth chapter, verses 10 through 11. So let's get started with justif justified by faith in Christ, verses one through five of the fifth chapter. Verse one reads, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think the following scriptures covers this verse completely. It gives you a good idea of what it means. So the scriptures I want to use is Ephesians, the second chapter, verses eight through 10, and Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 18 through 19. So starting with Romans, 2, 8 to 10, no, I'm sorry, Ephesians, second chapter, 8 through 10. And it reads, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus 
for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And the second verse is Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 18 through 19. And it reads, therefore, as though one man's offense, offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, though, one man's righteousness, righteous act, one man's righteous act, the free, the free gift of gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might be abound, might, might abound but, there, but where sin abound, grace abounds much more. Now these verses indicate that if we are justified by faith, we have peace with God because of Jesus. Now, our second verse is, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The key word in this verse is access. From the time of the sin of Adam to the res resurrection of Jesus, few men had direct access to God. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, everyone who believes on Jesus has direct access to God. We do not gain access to God through our goodness. We have been given access to God by the work of Jesus, works of Jesus, that is. We can confess our sins to Jesus. We can communicate with Jesus through prayer. We can tell him about our troubles and we can talk to him about anything, anytime. Now we are given this access by faith. This access gives us hope while we're here on earth. By this, I mean everyone living on earth will suffer in some way, form or fashion. But those who do not know Jesus have no hope when they suffer in some form or fashion. Many may think they will go to heaven when they die, but many will not go to heaven when they die because of the disbelief in Jesus. So a lot of people are talking about going to heaven, but a lot aren't going. Now, but the hope Christians have is knowing that there is a better place awaiting them when we die. So that gives us hope in this world because we know that there's a better place when we die. And that better place compares heaven to hell. You choose choosing as to what you think is best. Now we have hope while going through troubles here on earth because we know that our hope is anchored in the glory of God and through his son and that we will be with him through eternity. Now verses three and four read, and not so only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. Now, when I read verses three and four above, I am reminded of a song that says, I'm so glad trouble don't last always, which is a paradox in reality. Now, paradox is basically says that uh, something that seems to be true is basically you can't explain it. Basically, if I say that uh, there's a mount, there's snow on the mountains, and as I said, and we say that the higher we get, the warmer it gets on earth, that's a paradox because I'm down here in a valley and there's no snow in the valley, but there is snow on the mountain. So it seems that that's a paradox. We say that the closer we get to the, uh, the higher we get in our altitude, the hotter it gets, but that's not the case when we look at it from that standpoint. Because while we are on earth, trouble will be forever present. Maybe not today or next year, but one can be reassured that trouble will come knocking at the door while you are alive and kicking on this earth. But for Christians, trouble or tribulation is something good because we know that Jesus will not allow us to go through the worst tribulation on earth. And that is a great tribulation. And the trouble, the, the, word states, the world states that 
A loving God would not allow people to go through trouble. But if you are a child of God, you will go through trouble because that is one of the ways God uses to teach us patience, give us experience in his ways, and also give us hope when we leave this world, if nothing else. Now, Christians do not seek tribulation, but when it occurs, we know that it is for a, a God-given reason. God brings us about tribulation, basically kind of make us stronger in many cases. Now, verse five reads, and hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now, Christians are not ashamed of hope because it is the love of God. This love that God has for us is made real through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that keeps our hope alive. When we are passing through a storm, the Holy Spirit tells us in a still small voice to keep believing on the Lord, in the Lord because he will not forsake us in the midst of the storm. Now the fiery darts of Satan are, are constant in our lives, but the Holy Spirit dulls the pain by letting us know that he is not more powerful than God. So yet, even though we're going through pain at this time, God may allow Satan to do certain things as he did with Job, but Satan cannot, yeah, he's not more powerful than God. He can do no more than God allows him to do. So those fiery darts of Satan are there. Maybe God allows them so that we can become stronger and we can rely on him to help us to avoid those fiery darts of Satan. Now that concludes our, verse, our first section. Now let's go to justified by the blood of Christ. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses six through nine. Verse six reads, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now Jesus' death on the cross provided strength for mankind. Before Jesus, our hope was not strong enough to save us because we were sinners and could do nothing about it. But in due time and on God's schedule, Christ died for our sins and our hope gained strength. Verse seven reads, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet poor adventure for a good man, some would even die, dare to die. But God commandeth his love toward us, commendeth that is his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now I cannot point to anyone who would willingly take my place in death, that is die for me. Now, many people, like some of Jesus' disciples prior to his death on the cross, said they would die for Jesus. But when the time came for them to act, they were nowhere to be found. When I was in the army, I read stories about soldiers falling onto uh, grenades to protect their, their soldiers that were in the surrounding them, or their squad for that matter, from the deadly shrapnel from the, the grenade exploding. In other words, they would see the grenade and you only have seconds to make a decision. And those seconds, that person would fall under shrapnel because he knew that that shrapnel would be spread throughout the ranks of his fellow soldiers. So if his body fell on it, his body would absorb all the shrapnel. But God loved us enough to send his son to die for sinners like you and me. It is not an instinctive act of Jesus, on Jesus' part. It was God displaying his love for all sinners. You see, when the soldier falls on that gray grenade, he is not dying for his uh, fellow soldiers. He is dying instinctively. He sees the grenade and he knows there's death in there and he sees his fellow soldiers. So he instinctively falls on the grenade so that the other, he can save the others. Now that's not telling, that's not saying, not going up to his friends and say, I'll die for you. He instinctively died for them based on basically knowing what the grenade would do. But God's love for us, basically there's no instinct about that. He loves us. And God loves us enough to send his son to die for sinners like you and me. It was not an instinctive act on Jesus's part like the soldier might have done. It was God displaying his love for all sinners. Now this love of God 
and the sacrificial death of Jesus was a planned event that was born on the day that Adam sinned against God. Make no mistake about it. Jesus died, did die for our sins so that we can gain, again, have a relationship with God. Now verse nine reads, for more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now verse one of this lesson states that we have peace with God because we are justified by faith. If God justifies us, we are indeed justified and rendered sinless if we confess our sins to Jesus. Jesus is our mediator between us and God. When we confess our sins to Jesus, God does not see them. If God does not see our sins, then we are in a st state like Adam was before he ate the forbidden fruit. That is, we have a relationship with God, and sin doesn't exist, or as it didn't exist in, in, in Adam before he sinned. Now, this relationship did not occur about, this relationship did not come about only because we are justified by the blood of Jesus. It came about because God established it so that everyone can have a relationship with him if they only believe on, in the Son who was part of God's plan to eliminate sin in mankind. And that concludes the second section of our lesson. So let's go on to justified by the life of Christ, which is the third and final section. That's verses 10 through 11. And they read, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Sinners are the enemies of God. But wait a minute. God said if we believe on his son, we are no longer in an adversarial relationship with God. We become citizens of his kingdom. Now, this is only possible through the grace of God and the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary. Jesus' death reconciled us to God by his blood. In other words, it made it possible that we can have a relationship with God. Verse 11 reads, and not so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, if we really think about what God did for us, we should be amazed. Mankind was God's enemy. We deserve to die. But in the fullness of time, God gave man a savior that can not only save them, but God accepted his former enemies, us sinners, due to the actions of Jesus on the cross. Now, it says we, we received, by, received the atonement. Now, the atonement refers in this case to the forgiveness, forgiving or pardoning of sin in general, and the original sin in particular through the suffering, death, resurrection of Jesus. Now, mankind should thank God for this atoning atonement of sin, and we should praise him, his, him for his mighty act of love for us as well. And that, my friend, Christian friends, concludes our Sunday school lesson, and let us close in prayer. Gracious Father, I am thankful that you have gone with us through this lesson. I thank the Holy Spirit for being there with us, and I ask the Holy Spirit to show us how to make this lesson living within our, our lives each and every day. Help it to be something that we can use, and when we are asked about this saving grace, we can tell them. I thank you and I praise you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Help this lesson to be a blessing to each and every one that hears it, and each and every one that tells it to someone else. I thank you and I praise you in the name of Jesus. I ask it all. Amen.